Hey guys, welcome to a brand new video on bubble maps in D3.js. Now, in this video, I'm going to be explaining why this code right here paints what we are what we're wanting to build on the right right here. And in the next video, I'm going to be building and deleting all this code and building the actual project with you guys. Uh, first of all, big thanks to D3 Graph Gallery. I, I copied this example from them and I think it's really awesome. Okay, let's get to it. First of all, let's take a look at this thing right here. We can see that there are a lot of circles and we can see there is one map. When I first saw this, I thought that the map was just a picture. And then these circles were just probably specified from with some X and Y attributes and just painted on them. Now that approach could work, but because we're dealing with maps and longitude and latitudes and there are different manners of projecting a map. For example, this right here is a Mercator projection. But we have you know polar maps and a lot of different maps you know as we can see right here uh that is not the case right so it's just not going to be a picture so this map is actually drawn with a geojson file um and each of the geojson file will contain a features array and each of the feature array will uh, will represents one small region that probably represents a country on this map so let's explore what a GeoJSON object looks like by logging it in our HTML file. Or I mean our Google Chrome console. That's what I meant. Or Firefox, if that's what you prefer. So this right here is the GeoJSON object and we can see it has an array of features. And for each of these features, um, it really is a geometry with type polygon and this geometry was defined with a lot of different xy pairs and a lot of uh, coordinates so if we look at a different one oh there's a lot mm, yeah polygon and maybe 18 coordinates on this one and for like a bigger thing like i don't know russia if it's painted with one geojson it might be like more coordinates right so Oh, and then uh, let's talk about the actual SVG that is drawn this. If we F12 this, go to elements, let's select a random path. Now we can see that uh, there are a lot of different paths that is making up this map. And it seems like each path represents a country almost. Uh, that right there, I don't know why it has the whole northern hemisphere. But most of these represent a country as we can see. Uh, that's definitely... Actually, I don't know those countries. Um, maybe if we go to China, that's China. That's Greenland. Yeah, that's Canada. So, and if we select Canada, for example, oh God. Um, we can see that in the, we can see that in the HTML SVG path, it is really represented with a path tag with a really really long d attribute and this d attribute contains a string that a, that is composed with a lot of numbers and so the intuition might be well it's probably taking from this feature array each of the individual coordinates and mapping that to a single svg path and doing that for every single one of the uh, feature so there should probably be 177 SVG path uh, and guess what that intuition is correct but there are more to be explained with this intuition because uh, with mapping it just into uh, it just by default a pretty hard problem and we're gonna look at how exactly we extract the coordinates so that it turns into an SVG path there's a little bit of mapping that is going on um, that is not just straight up extracting and putting in them, shoving them in into SVG path. Now, one of the reasons that we're not just extracting those uh, coordinates and then shoving them into SVG path is because people like to uh, represent maps in different ways. Uh, this is a Mercator projection again, and there are different map projections like Lagrange and 
and the special characteristic of a mercator graph projection is that no that's not one but let's say this one the longitudes and the latitudes are actually perpendicular to, to each other this one of course we may see that it's not right but there are a lot of ways that we want to represent different maps and so these coordinates from the geojson file have to go through different mapping in order to get the projection that we want now of course we're not just going to be copy and paste and code every time there's probably going to be an api that does the mapping for us and exactly that is what's going on d3.geo path does that for us and you know what let's just let's just read the d3.geo path um, api for further intuition so we can know about the arguments and stuff um, path okay so we define a d3.geo path with a projection object and then it says if we if we do d3 geopath of some object which may be any geojson feature it will render that given object so that's really it all we got to know is now how to instantiate that projection in our case is the d3 mercator projection and then we're just going to apply that projection onto each of the individual d3 I mean, the, each of the individual GeoJSON feature. Uh, so let me tell you, uh, the way we create that projection is by doing this. Well, our projection equals the Geo Mercator, and it given it some attributes like center, scale, translate. You can mess around with those. I personally haven't figured them out exactly. And scale is actually really weird. Okay, so yep. So we have the projection defined. Now we know that when we take the coordinates in each of the individual features, we're putting them specifically through the Geo Mercator projection instead of, you know, let's say the Lagrange, um, Lagrange projection, right? Again, that's the whole reason why APIs because there's so many variations of so many different ways people might present something. Uh, in my head, at least, the first thing I think of a map is the Mercator, but of course people want to represent things different ways, right? So now let's talk about how these are actually rendered. How do we actually append uh, path objects to our map? I mean, how do we append path objects to build our map? Right. So now it's more of the programming side and the utilization of the API. So we're going to do d3.q and we're going to load a GeoJSON file, which we then call await ready. And so in this function, we're able to get that data. So data geo is our geojson string, our geojson object. What we're gonna do next is then straight up do. I'm gonna delete some of these here because it's just like repetitive code, and I was like logging some of the things. Oh, did that made it not work? Um, let's see, let's see. Maybe this one will work. Huh? Oh, do that. Okay, that works. Uh, the circles are not showing, but I'm not worried about that right now. I, and I don't know why it's not showing. But anyways, we are... Let me just delete this too. We are defining the projection and calling the path. I mean, we're defining the geopath and giving it the projection, calling that path. Wait a second. I'm... That's weird. Okay. But we're going to be appending a G container to our original SVG. And then we're going to make an empty selection. Then we're going to bind data geo, which is our J JSON string, dot features, which has 177 elements, as we remember. And recall in the d3.geo geo API, it says if we call that d3.geo path on a any geo.json feature, it's going to render the given object. Right now, it's not going to directly render. Uh, it's not going to implicitly be calling dot append in here, but we can get the calculation of the uh, map uh, of the SVG path that we want to render back. Uh, why did it open this? I wanted to show you guys. Oh, the D three, the data geo dot feature string console. Right, this is one hundred seventy seven elements of features. And so for each of these feature, I mean, we're going to enter it. So it's going to return 177 internals because we have 170 elements 
minus zero selection selected elements. So it's 170 internodes that we're gonna uh, get back. And for each of those internodes, we're gonna actually draw a path. And what is gonna be the value and calculation for that path? Well, we're gonna run um, the feature through the d3.geopath function, which will return the calculations. And that's really it for the map. I don't think there's more to it. Uh, the important thing is to realize d3.geopath helps us to go from GeoJSON directly to um, directly to the SVG path as long as we give it a specific projection. Or there should be a default projection, but I'm not sure what it looks like. Uh, versus versus if we have to do the whole thing by ourselves without api we'll have to go through that individual coordinates and collect stuff and recombine and then append them individually to a uh, svg path which is a lot of more work okay second part let's do the circles now i don't know why the circle is not showing up so i'm just going to control z to when it did work and disregard what i did wrong when i was simplifying the code Looks like that this worked. Okay. So the question arises: the, uh, the, um, It might seem like okay. Well, each of these, each of these, um, let me see. Each of these circles are probably defined with some x and y. But what if the you know? So is it going to be different if we draw these on a Mercator map? versus if we draw these on a polar map. But you can keep in mind that we can run these through projections too, right? Earlier we said only a geo, uh, uh, I mean, then the question is, well, do we have to model our circle in a geo-JSON object, like, uh, like model them as individual features? Uh, the answer to that is no, because if we go to projections, we can actually call projection uh, and then parentheses point to return a new array x, y that is going to be representing a projected point of the uh, of the given point. So it's going to run it through the projection. Now, first of all, I didn't even show you guys the data to the circle. Uh, so it might be confusing to you guys what I'm talking about. Well, I'm going to show you guys right now. We have a s array of 9,000 elements. So let's just select the first one. Let's see what it is. So it's going to give you home lads, home lawn, and end value, uh, which can be anything you want to interpret, and Antarctica. So we can think of this you know, as X, Y, whatever you want to do. If we look at another one, the end might be one. Uh, right here, three. Well, I can tell you in advance, some of these end get really big. And a big end results in a big circle. Okay. So now you know that the circles are based on this home lawn and home lads attribute. Now again, uh, the intuition might be that, well, these are not geo-JSON, but we can run these through projection as specified in the API to return what these points should be pinpointed and located at if we're doing this through a specific, a specific projection. Uh, so. The way we're going to render these is SVG dot select all my circles, which is going to be empty selection at first. Then we're going to do dot data, bind the data to them. And data in this case comes from this D3 CSV, right? And then we go to here, right? This goes here and then we can use the data later here. So this is going to be an array of, what is it? Like 9,000 elements. And we're going to return that many internodes. Then for each of these in individual internodes, we're going to return a circle. So it's 100, 9,413 circles. Um, and for each of these circles, we're going to give it an X and Y and radius, of course, because we're drawing a circle. So we still need those. Now to get that radius, hopefully it makes sense now that we're going to run it through the projection function. Oh, uh, in case you didn't know where this came from, we defined this back here. Right, it is a the, the Mercator projection, and therefore it's going to be aligned perfectly with our map. And we're going to take the first element of that because projection returns the array, the actual x y pair. Uh, we're going to take the first one, which is the x, 
Then for the radius, we see something that we might not understand for the first second, which is size. Oh, in case you didn't know what plus meant, it's just like a, it's kind of like casting in, it's just like, well, we're gonna interpret this value as a number, right? Size might not make sense. Well, size is obviously looks like a function, and it seems like if we run a number through size, we're gonna return the radius. Um, now, in this case, size, this function size is called a D3 scale. Now, in D3 scales, where's the D3 scale that I made? Well, I didn't make it really. The, the person who coded this made it. But the way we scale this is, the, the way we make any D3 scales is to define a domain and a range. In this range, we can probably expect is what will be outputted if we if we put in a new value for the domain. And this range right here also represents our maximum and minimum radius. And for the domain, it is value extent. Uh, well, we don't need to... Value extent comes from data and is basically representing the minimum value to the maximum value. So this is the domain of the n value in that data that we remember. So it's all of these individual ends put into an array. And we're going to take the minimum and uh, maximum. So we're going to map the minimum to the maximum to 1 to 50. But we're not going to map it linearly. We're going to map it with a square root scale. So it kind of looks like a y equals to rad x or square root of x a graph if you prefer. And what that means is that as the domain, as we increase in the n value the rate the range which is the y output actually gets slower grows slower and slower so yeah hopefully that just makes sense on its own i can't think of a way to explain it on the top of my head uh so for a really large n you only you know so think about it if you have a the smallest size the smallest n possible you're still going to be returning one um, but if it's linear, if it's linear scale, then that means if you have an n that is 50 times 1, which is going to be only if n of 50, you're actually going to be returning that r radius of 50, which is the maximum. But it's not linear, and so uh, we, we take it through the square root and it becomes a lot, a lot, a lot smaller. Uh, so then we can do style, and this color thing right here is something easier, it's also like a scale sort of. And we're mapping the home continents, if you remember, to uh, different colors. And this one right here also probably should make sense. If the value is greater than 2000, then we draw with black. So that's really it for this video. I Hopefully the explanation made sense. The most important part you still have to understand is that GeoJSON can be mapped to different SVG path element, which together can look like a map if you specify a projection. And... Remember that if you're drawing your circles or you want to paint something on the map, then you better uh, run that through, run that point through your projection so that it aligns perfectly well. That's it for the video. It's a, it's been long. It's like 18 minutes now, so I'm gonna shut up and I will code this together with you guys in the next one.